vacation. <laughs> it's hard for a preacher to take vacation. It really is. I remember what that was like. Because even when you go on vacation, you're away, and you say, okay, well, here's one Sunday. Kind of take it easy, rest a little bit, because preaching takes a lot out of you. But you go visit somewhere, and they see you, and they know you're preaching. They say, hey, why don't you do our lesson while you're here? And you go, okay, I'll do it. So you don't, can't get away from it. But uh, Sam is here, but he's on vacation. Uh, our lesson this morning is found in 2 Corinthians chapter 6. And so go ahead and open your Bibles there. We're going to talk about working together with God. What a great blessing it is that we are allowed to work in the kingdom of God, that we have a part in this great mission of seeking and saving those who are lost. Yes, understanding that Jesus paid the ultimate price, he died and gave his life so that people can have salvation, but that we have our part that we can tell that good news to others. Look at 2 Corinthians 6 and verse 1. It says, We then as workers together with him beseech you also that you receive not the grace of God in vain. Now first let's talk about the last part of the verse. Where it says that you receive not the grace of God in vain. God's grace is such a wonderful thing. It is the unmerited favor that we receive. In other words, we don't deserve it. The forgiveness of sins, the salvation that we can receive through Christ, we don't deserve that. We're sinners. When we transgress God's law, we are guilty of sin, and we are deserving of punishment. But because of God's grace, He gives us a way of salvation. Now this says, don't receive that in vain. Vain means empty, useless. Don't make that grace of no value to you. In Titus 2 and verse 11 it says, For the grace of God hath appeared unto all men. In other words, God has shown His grace to everybody. So you think, well then everybody's going to be saved. No. For some, the grace of God will be in vain because they will not receive it, they will not obey it, they will not serve God as they should, they want no part of it. And so that grace does no good for them. But in 2 Corinthians, Paul is writing to Christians. So, I mean, we understand the alien sinner, those who do not care about spiritual things, do not care about righteousness. Well, yeah, obviously God's grace is doing nothing for them because they won't accept it. But this is written to Christians. And it says, beseech you also that you receive not the grace of God in vain. And that grace is so important. Titus 3 and verse 7, the second part says, Being justified by His grace, we should be heirs according to the hope of eternal life. That's the only way we're going to have eternal life, is through that grace. But it can be in vain if we don't do what we're supposed to do. And there is something for us to do. Now, we could continue on through the text and see a whole list of things, avoiding those sinful things, living that righteous life. But I want to focus just on this verse and what it says. Notice the first part. We then as workers together with Him. Workers. As Christians, we are supposed to be workers. Christianity is not for the lazy. Do you understand that? You say, well, I've obeyed the gospel, I've done my part, I've been baptized, now I can just sit back in the pew and take it easy. That's not Christianity. And that's not how it's portrayed in God's Word. There are things for us to do. We need to be setting up Bible studies. If we're teaching a Bible class, we need to be preparing those lessons. Maybe it's working on the building, making sure everything is set. That we can have a nice place to worship. 
Maybe it's visiting the sick, the shut-ins, the bereaved. Maybe it's sending cards of encouragement, calling members to lift them up and strengthen them. There are things to do. And none of them are easy. But Christianity is not a call to an easy life. It's a call to work. There are things to be done. You know, Jesus said in John 15 and verse 14, You are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. Now, that little two-letter word, do, says do. You have to do these things. Maybe we'd like to take that out, but it's there. There are things for us to do. What are we doing for the Lord? How much effort are we putting in? You know, attendance alone, though important and vital, yes, that's not enough. i say, well, that's, that's all there is. I come Sunday morning to Bible class. I come Sunday morning to worship, Sunday night and Wednesday night. I've done what I need to do. No, that's just the beginning. That's the part that we are blessed to do, that we are allowed to do, to come together, to draw strength one from another, to worship God. That's what we get to do. That's a blessing. That's a wonderful thing. But there are works to be done. In James 2 and verse 24, it says, You see then how that by works a man is justified and not by faith only. I think too many of us want to just rely on our faith. Say, I believe in God. I believe in Christ. I believe in the church. Okay, good. Wonderful. Wonderful. You're not justified just by faith. There are works to be done. Somebody once asked this question. If you were arrested for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? Now think about that. What are you doing? There are things to be done. We need to be workers for the Lord. You know, in so many places in the Bible, it it describes the kingdom as being a vineyard. And you think about all the work and care that must take place in a vineyard if it's going to produce its crop. A lot of cultivating, a lot of working that has to take place. Well, we need to realize that. In the kingdom, there is work to do. And you say, well, wow, that sounds hard, Russell. That's asking a lot. Okay, well, let me give you some help. Notice the verse again. We then, as workers together. Do you see that? Yeah, you say, well, the work's hard. There's so much to do. Yeah, but you're not alone. It's not just you. It's all of us, brothers and sisters in Christ, all of us, the family of God. We are working together. You know, a task is so much easier When you have help, if it's just one person, yeah, that's a hard job. But you add two, three, ten, a hundred, two hundred, three hundred. We've got a lot of workers and we are working together. It is a shared mission and we all have to work together if it's going to be successful. Look back at 1 Corinthians. I know you're there at 2 Corinthians, but look back at 1 Corinthians chapter 3. I want you to notice this in the early church, first century, that they were working together. They understood that concept. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, look at verse 5. Paul writes, Who then is Paul? And who is Apollos? But ministers, that's just another word for servants, but ministers by whom you believed, even as the Lord gave to every man. In other words, every man has work to do. Notice he says, I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then neither is he that planteth anything, neither is he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. The one who's doing the planting, the one who's doing the watering, 
they're one. They're united. It's the same purpose. It's the same goal. And here, of course, it says it's God who gives the increase. But notice that working together. He says, neither is he that planteth anything, neither is he that watereth. In other words, it's not about us as individuals. It's not about, hey, look how much work I have done for the Lord. And then looking to others and saying, well, you haven't done very much. Why haven't you done more for the Lord? Why haven't you done as much as me? That's not what this is about. We're all working together. And it doesn't matter that we all have different parts and different things, different talents, different gifts. We're all contributing. And so we're all important. And we all pull together in the work of the Lord. But we've got to pull together. We've got to be united. If we are not united, we will not prosper. We will not be blessed. I have seen so many congregations that are just fussing and quarreling over foolish things that amount to nothing. I have seen small towns where the congregation of the Lord's people split into two different congregations just because they couldn't get along. Not over a matter of doctrine. No, they just couldn't get along. They just couldn't stand each other. And so now you have two congregations in this tiny little town. Well, how are they to set a good example? How are they to evangelize in that community when they're not united? 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 10 Paul says, now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. Now, I know for the most part this is talking about that there be no divisions. You speak the same thing. This is talking about doctrinally. You have to speak the same thing, be on the same page. We're proclaiming God's truth and only God's truth. But it can be just as damaging if we're not united over matters of opinion. Because there will be matters of opinion, and there will be disagreements over trivial things. But we have to understand those are trivial things. What we are about is so much more important. We are seeking to save those who are lost. We are trying to get God's saving message into a dying world. There are souls at stake. We don't have time to fuss and quarrel over trivial things. Those things don't matter. And if our feelings get hurt, we need to get over it. Because there is something more important. Our God and His Word and our Savior and His salvation. That's where we need to focus. And that's where we must be united. We must be joined together in that same mind. In other words, we're all thinking the same way. In Philippians 2 and verse 2, it says, fulfill ye my joy that you be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord and one mind. One accord, joined together, one mind, thinking the same way. We can have that unity that we should. And then we can accomplish great things. So as we're working, it's not just us alone. It's all our brothers and sisters in Christ joined with us, working together for a common goal. And if we're not that way, if we're not united, if we're divided, then we can accomplish nothing. In Matthew 12 and verse 25, it says, And Jesus knew their thoughts, And he said unto them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and every city or house divided against itself shall not stand. So every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation. Even the kingdom of God? Yeah. Here in this community, if we're not united, if the kingdom of God is not united the way that it should be, then we're not going to be able to accomplish God's will. We're not going to be able to reach out to those in our community and show them the way of truth, to show them that one mind of love and one accord. We've got to be united. Yes, we are workers. We are workers together. 
And so that gives us great strength when we think about that, how it's not us alone, that we have others, brothers and sisters in Christ, working with us. But now let me show you something even better. And this is really the best part of the lesson. Look at our text again, 2 Corinthians 6 and verse 1. It says, We then, as workers together with Him, beseech you also that you receive not the grace of God in vain. Workers together with Him. With who? With God. So it's not us just alone, and it's not just us with our brothers and sisters in Christ. We are working together with God. Now, you may have something a little bit different in your translation. I'm reading from King James Version. The translators of the King James Version, they put in italics type that which the translators have added. And so the with him in italics type is not in the original text. And you say, well, it shouldn't be there then. They've made a mistake. We're not working together with God. All right, hold on. Look back to 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 9. 1 Corinthians 3 and verse 9. Because I think this is the idea that we're talking about in our text. 1 Corinthians 3 and verse 9, it says, For we are laborers, workers, together with God. You are God's husbandry. That means a cultivated field. You are God's building. Do you see that? We are workers together with God. So if our text doesn't specifically say that, it's certainly in there. And that's what 1 Corinthians 3 and verse 9 is telling us. And notice, workers together with God, you're God's cultivated field. You're God's building, that which is produced. And we are working side by side with our God. Now, how much strength does that bring us? How wonderful, how great is that? When we think down through history of all the times that God lifted up those who were weak, those who were small. Do you remember God used a shepherd boy to defeat a giant? A giant, a man of war. God used a little shepherd boy. David was strong because God was with him. David was able to accomplish great things because God was with him. David was able to have a great victory that day because God was with him. In turn, we are strong because God is with us. We are able to accomplish great things for Him because God is with us. We are able to have the victory because God is with us. Do you see that strength? Do you see that power? But we have to understand, there's no neutrality here. Either we're with God or we're not. Jesus said in Matthew 12 and verse 30, He that is not with me is against me, and he that gathereth not with me scattereth abroad. We have to make sure that we're on the right side. We have to make sure that we're on God's side. That's the side that's going to have the victory. That's the side that's going to win the day. And we want to be on that side. There have been times when those who were following God wavered, didn't do what they were supposed to do. Maybe they weren't on God's side at one time or another. Look at Matthew chapter 16. Do you remember Peter and the strength that he had, the strength of character? He was rather impetuous. He was quick to speak, had a strong faith. Absolutely. Sometimes he would waver. Sometimes he would take the wrong approach. Look at Matthew 16, starting with verse 21. It says, From that time forth began Jesus to show his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem 
and suffer many things of the elders and the chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him. Can you imagine that? Here is Peter taking the Lord Jesus Christ and rebuking him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. This can't be right. There's no way. You're the Messiah. You're going to be killed? But he turned and he said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art an offense unto me, for thou savorest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. Now, was Peter literally Satan? Well, of course not. But he had lost his focus. Now, that's what Satan would have wanted. He would have wanted to convince Christ not to do it. Not so, Lord, no. Don't do that. Don't die on the cross. So, in fact, Peter was kind of taking Satan's side in this. And so Jesus had to correct him and does it rather sternly. He says, get thee behind me, Satan. Why are you saying such a thing? That's not what God would have us to do. I am to give my life on that cross and I am ready to do so. And then notice why. And this is where it applies to us. This is the key. This is what we have to think about because this is going to stop us as well from being on the right side, being with God the way we're supposed to be. He says, get thee behind me, Satan, thou art an offense unto me, for thou savorest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. That's what gets us. <laughs> That's where we fail so often. We start thinking about the things of men, the things of this world, the things that we want. And we forget about the things that God wants. And what he would have first in our lives. And when we do that, we're not really with him. We're thinking of self. Think about the Apostle Paul as well. Look at Acts chapter 26. As Paul was recounting his conversion account, remember before he was the Apostle Paul, he was Saul. He was a persecutor of the church. He was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. And in Acts 26 and verse 9, he says, I verily thought with myself that I ought to do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. Later on, when he would write to 1 Timothy, he would confess, chapter 1, verse 13, that he was before a blasphemer, a persecutor, injurious. He said, but I obtained mercy. I obtained mercy. Now, that kind of goes back to what we were originally talking about with the grace the grace that we have in Jesus Christ. That God loves us so much that He gave us His Son to die for us, to take our place, to take our punishment. And here Paul, he realizes that. Before, yes, I did many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. I was a blasphemer, a persecutor, injured others. But I obtained mercy. You see the difference between being away from God, separate from God, fighting against God, and being with God. With God is the place of mercy. With God is the place of grace. That's where we want to be. We want to be united with Him. We want to be working with Him. And we cannot work with God unless we are willing to submit and obey and teach His will. Not our own, but His will. We have to submit to Him to be with Him, to work with Him, to be in the same goal, the same cause, to seek and save those who are lost. So we've got to be willing to stand for the truth to teach that which is right, to teach the doctrines of Christ and not the doctrines of men. Matthew 15 and verse 9, Jesus says, But in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. The doctrines of men and the churches that those doctrines have created, 
they only serve to trouble God's desire. They only serve to bring disunity. And in the end, they're going to be destroyed. The sad thing is, they think they're with God. There are so many religiously minded individuals who think they're with God. They think they're working with God, but they're not. Now remember the Apostle Paul. When he was Saul, when he was the persecutor of the church, he thought he was doing God's will. He thought that that's what God wanted him to do, to stamp out this Christianity. He saw that as a new religion, a sect that did not belong. So he thought he was being righteous, but he was wrong. Now that shows us that you can be very zealous and still be wrong. Those in the religious world today that will not submit to God's will, will not obey His truth, teaching the doctrines of men rather than the doctrines that God would have them to teach, where do they stand? Not with God. They are standing with themselves. In Matthew 15, starting with verse 10, it says, And he called the multitude and said unto them, Hear and understand. Now that which goeth into the, the mouth defileth a man, but that which goeth out of the mouth, this defileth a man. Then came his disciples and said unto him. So here's some of the teaching of Christ and how people were responding to his teaching. They asked Jesus, Knowest thou that the Pharisees were offended after they heard this saying? I said, Jesus, don't you know that that offended them? It's almost like when Peter took him aside to rebuke him. Hey, uh, Jesus, are you sure you know what you're doing here? They were upset at that. Maybe you shouldn't have taught that. They're very offended. But he said unto them, Every plant which my heavenly Father hath not planted shall be rooted up, shall be pulled up by the roots. And we talked about before that we are his workmanship. We are that cultivated field pulled up by the roots if we're not doing God's will, if we're not teaching that which is right, if we're offended by the truth. And how many religious groups are offended by the truth today? When you tell them simple Bible truth, and they say, no, I don't believe that. How dare you say such a thing? They can be rooted up. They can be rooted up. We cannot be working together with God unless we are united with God. When we are teaching what He would have us to teach, when we are practicing what He would have us to practice, then we're with Him. Then we're on a joint mission. Then we are together. Let us make sure that we are working with God and not against Him. You know that verse, 1 Corinthians 3 and verse 9, we are laborers together with God. That should give us great strength. <laughs> that should give us great hope. Return to our text. We then as workers together with Him beseech you also that you receive not the grace of God in vain. You see how that is a package deal. That grace of God that brings unto us eternal salvation through Jesus Christ the Son. We are workers together with Him. We are working with God for that common goal, that common purpose. Now notice what I said, working with God. I know those places in the Bible where it talks about that it's a vineyard and we are workers in the vineyard. We kind of get that idea that we are working for God. That it's almost an employer-employee relationship. That He's the boss and we're the employee and we are working for Him. Well, yeah, He is the boss and He does have all authority and we understand that. But let's not miss the picture here. It's not that we're working just for Him. We're working with Him. He's in the vineyard with us. He is laboring at our side. And we are not alone in this effort. There is great work for us to do. 
in this community? Are there any souls that need saving? Any at all? Oh, yeah. There's a lot of people who have not heard the gospel. There are a lot of people who do not know. There are a lot of people who are religiously confused. What are we doing about it? Are we reaching out to them the way that we should? Are we working with our God to bring the gospel, that good news, to those who are lost? There's work to be done, and we are not alone. Yeah, it's it's work for us. We have to look at ourselves. We have to look inwardly. Am I doing what I'm supposed to do? But understand, it's not just about me. I have my brothers and sisters in Christ. We're united in this effort to take the gospel into this world, and we are united in this effort with our God. He is our strength in this. He is our power in this. And if we do His will, we are going to prosper. We're going to reach those lost souls. We are going to see a difference. God is with us, and there is work to do. If you're here this morning and you have not obeyed the gospel, I would pray that you would do so. Don't wait. Don't put it off. You say, well, I'm just not good enough. Nobody's good enough. That's the point. That's why we need salvation. That's why we need the blood of Jesus Christ. Come to Him. You can have forgiveness. If you believe that Jesus is the Christ, that He's the Son of God, and you're ready to repent of your sins and confess Him as Lord and Master of your life, you can be baptized. Have your sins washed away, not in the water. There's nothing special about the water. It's just Corsicana water. Your sins will be washed away in the blood of Christ. That's why He went to that cross. That's why He shed His blood so that He could wash away your sins. And He wants to do that this morning. If you haven't obeyed the gospel, do it. Be baptized this very morning. If you are a Christian, you've done that, but perhaps you've stumbled. Maybe you haven't lived as you should. Maybe you're struggling with something. If you've got sin in your life, you need to make it right. And the blood of Jesus Christ works for you as well. It continues to cleanse us as Christians when we stumble, when we fall. That we can pray to God, repent of that sin, and we will receive forgiveness. If we can help, please come as we stand and as we sing.